Good morning, everyone, and happy Easter. I'm standing here on the Cascade Crest. It's uh, made visible by this rope because it's a very interesting place. All this snow falls right here, but goes in different directions. This snow goes this way out into Puget Sound. This snow goes this way all the way down into Oregon and Astoria. Here's why this matters on Resurrection Sunday. There were two groups of people who saw the same thing. They saw the resurrection. They knew it had happened, but one group responded with love. They went on to change the world. The other group responded with fear. They went on to live small, depressing lives. Which way will you choose? That's our challenge and hope this morning. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful that we can gather here within these walls and listen for your voice this morning. And uh, we are mindful as we look at history that the issue on the table for us this morning isn't did it happen. It's rather what we do with it. So would you speak to us? We pray in Christ's name. Amen. As we saw in the text, a couple of different groups of people, both seeing the same thing, digest the same data, leading to two entirely different directions of life. And I want to unpack both of those groups for you to kind of understand the, the answer to the question, why did they respond the way they did? And so we're going to be looking at the religious leaders, and we're also going to be looking at the, the, the women at the tomb and the guards. So let's begin by looking at the guards and the religious leaders. Now, if you understand the text, you understand that these guards in particular had been assigned uh, to guard the tomb in order to prevent the theft of the body, but... They'd had what wilderness ministry people would call experiential education. Something happened there at the tomb that shook them. They'd seen some very strange things happen, and they end up then with this body of evidence regarding the resurrection. They knew that a three to 4,000 pound stone had been moved away that was in place to prevent the theft of the body. They knew that, uh, of the angel's announcement to the women. They were there when the angel came. They knew of the grave clothes present inside the tomb. They knew of the missing body. They knew that if the body was stolen, the grave clothes wouldn't be there. They knew that the angel had said uh, that Jesus is risen and they watched the women filled with fear and great joy leave with a clear intent to obey and declare the message that Jesus was risen. And so for the guards, the evidence of what's true is essentially bomb-proof. Like they knew Jesus is risen from the dead. And this creates a crossroads moment for these guys. They can either believe that Jesus rose from the dead and stand in solidarity with whatever might come about as a result of this event, by declaring that the event is true and following the implications of that, or they can believe that it happened but choose to live in denial and cover it up. That's their crossroads, right? And so will they believe and identify with Jesus, or will they go the way of cover-up? And this is the moment when we should ask a very simple question, very important question at this moment in history, Does undeniable evidence always lead people to believe in in truth? Like if if you have enough evidence, do you always then embrace the logical conclusion? It's a rhetorical question. The obvious answer is what? No. (laughs) And we learn from this that mountains of evidence and truth that is undeniable in the light of even firsthand experience does not always lead people to move toward truth. And we know this because in this case, that's exactly what happened. In chapter 28 of Matthew, verse 11, the soldiers go to the chief priests because the chief priests were the ones who'd hired them to protect the body, to protect the notion that Jesus is dead because they'd heard hints of uh, Jesus possibly overcoming death and rising from the dead. And the result of that meeting was this. The religious leaders paid a bribe to the guards to create what I'm going to call fake news or alternative facts, pick whatever word you want. And, and, and the story of the religious leaders was that they, would, they promised to do whatever was necessary to protect the guards from punishment because Roman punishment for falling asleep on guard duty could be for them death. So the leaders in essence said, don't worry about that. We're going to do whatever it takes to protect you, we're going to do whatever it takes to, to cover it up, and that's kind of code for bribery here. We're going to give you a lot of money to create a story, and then we're going to protect your reputation. And so here's the situation. There's a group of soldiers. They were meant to guard the tomb, 
they were soldiers, so they were Romans. They had first person, undeniable evidence of the resurrection. And they go to the group of religious leaders who had seen Jesus raise a man from the dead just a week earlier and heard Jesus' teachings hinting at his own resurrection. And the religious leaders take offerings from the general fund and use those to create a cover-up story and protect the reputation of those who agreed to lie on their behalf. And the ones lying are willing to lie because they can be bought. And because they knew that without the protection of the religious leaders, the fact that they lost the body would most likely result in their own execution. So I'm just going to stop right here and say this. If you think what's going on in 2024 with election denial, lies, cover-ups, religious leaders conspiring with secular power to gain a hold on power, if you think this is new, you haven't been reading your Bible. <laughs> this is history and it's not just Bible history. This is the French Revolution. This is the, Rus the Russian Revolution. This is the rise of Mussolini. This is the rise of Hitler. This is the story of the Rwandan genocide. In every case, in God's name, people are pit against each other. And what we know to be true, we deny. Wow. I thought if I just had more evidence, I'd believe. No. <laughs> There's nothing new under the sun. There will always be people who know truth but create a lie and then stand by the lie, even though they know it's true. There will always be people with religious power who, as Paul warned Timothy, are in it for the money, who will say anything to maintain power, including creating temporary alliances with leaders of questionable moral character. This has been going on forever. So there's nothing new here, but the very important question I wanna ask this morning is why? Why did these leaders who saw with their own eyes an earthquake, a stone rolled away, an empty tomb, grave clothes, women giddy and overjoyed with gladness because they had heard the message from the angel that Jesus was risen, why did they, rather than responding in solidarity with what they knew to be true, why did they choose a cover-up? Why are lies chosen over truth? Why are cover-ups chosen over alignment with reality. And it can all be reduced to one word, and the word is this, fear. Fear. And my battery's dead, and now it's back on, so that's okay. And particularly, uh, what, what, what we want to see here is fear of loss. The guards are phrasing of, lo uh, of losing their jobs or their lives. The religious leaders are afraid of losing their positions, and we all know what's tied with our positions. Our, our, our position in life is our financial security, it's our reputation, it's our tribe of connections, it's our sphere of influence. And so here I am, and, and I have a position, and I have a reputation, and I'm deeply invested in whatever it is, so I go along with it. I'm deeply invested in this party, so I go along with it. I'm deeply invested in this denomination, so I go along with it. Or this brand of faith, so I go along with it. I'm deeply invested in this company, so I go along with it. If you watch this uh, uh, thing on Netflix called The Chosen, there's a powerful moment when Nicodemus encounters Jesus and he knows, he knows he's the Messiah. And then he goes home and his wife says, hey, I'm paraphrasing, don't make waves, I love our life. Man, that's haunting, or should be. Because following Jesus can be costly, and if we're afraid of losing anything, we can unconsciously, covertly, live functionally in denial of resurrection, and that's how systemic evil takes root in the world. <laughs> This is perhaps one of the reasons the gospel finds a wider receptivity among the poor than the wealthy. The poor have none to lose. And that could be one of the reasons that the church is growing faster in the southern hemisphere, which is more stuck in poverty than in Europe and North America, where on the whole, the church is not doing so well. <laughs> Listen, you will never build the life for which you're created on lies. You'll never build a life for which you're created if you insist on keeping the exact life you have now. If you're like this, I love this life, understand you're, you're, you're at risk because the way forward demands surrender and turning 
and opening your hand to hold all that you have and all that you are loosely. Without open hands, you will believe lies. I'll just tell you that my most rewarding moments as a pastor here at Bethany over 30 years have not been from the pulpit. Those are fine. The rewarding moments have been those moments when pastorally in relationship with people, I hear stories of people responding to God's revelation by naming their fear, confessing they're holding on to something, opening their hands, and then, and then watching them both fall in love with Jesus and watch Jesus take them in an entirely new direction in life. For one, it meant leaving Boeing as a defense contractor. <laughs> For another, it meant leaving Amazon. For another, it meant taking a job at Amazon. Both were terrified of the options there. <laughs> and one left and one went. For another, it meant specializing in gender ambiguity and obstetrics at the cost of loyalty of some evangelical friendships. <laughs> For another, it meant going to law school. For another, it meant taking up filmmaking. For another, it meant confessing an affair, rebuilding a broken marriage. But in every case, it meant facing the fear of change and loss, opening the hand, letting God give them a new life as they let go of that which was eating them up. <laughs> if discipleship is about moving people from here to there, the biggest challenge you and I face is that too often our response is this, I like it here. I don't want to move. And in a moment, we're going to see that the best way out of this mess is uh, taught to us by the woman at the tomb. But before that, I'm going to ask you to ask this question. You know, what is it that I'm clinging to so tightly that I'm at risk of rejecting truth in order to protect it? What do we cling to? A little hidden pleasure? A reputation? Our financial security, our, our house, our, 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 our job? What are we holding on to? Our, a particular view? A partisan political party? What, like, what is it that has become so woven into my identity that it's kind of, quote unquote, unshakable? Even at the cost of truth, I will not move. What is it? I gotta let go. How do I let go? Well, we learn from the women at the tomb. In chapter 28, verse 1, we read that there are two Marys at the tomb, and the first question we want to ask is, why are they there? And of course, the answer is that they're there to anoint the body of Jesus, but important to note, they're not there in search of evidence for resurrection. They're not there to steal the body. They're there to anoint the body. You see it in Matthew 28, you see it in Mark 16. So, I understand something about these women, very significant. Before there was a betrayal, and an arrest, and a trial, and a beating, and a mocking, and a host of disciples fleeing, and a cross being carried out to a hill, and a crucifixion, and a, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, and, and, and a word, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing, and finally a word, it is finished. Before any of that, for these women, there was something prior, and what was it? It was a relationship. They'd already fallen in love with Jesus. We don't know all the reasons they loved Jesus at the point of courageously staying with him at the cross while the disciples fled and now coming to the tomb on the first day of the Sabbath to anoint the body. It could be that one of them had demons cast out of her. It could be that one of them saw Jesus' commitment to caring for those on the margins and the sick. It, it may be evidence that maternal love is stronger than fear. But this is what we know. This is what we know. Their actions and their response to this situation, their actions were rooted in prior love. They loved Jesus. This is a big deal. I'm reading a book right now called Renovate by a neurotheologian named Jim Wilder. And in it, one of the questions that's pondered is how is it that people can cognitively believe creeds and believe that Jesus is the Son of God and rose from the dead and yet continue to live lives that are uh, filled with you know, greed or hidden fears or hidden addictions or bitterness or partisanship or tribalism or you know, this rush to violence. We declare the resurrection and yet the way we live looks utterly different than Jesus. How does that happen? And, and Wilder's you know, profound thesis, my paraphrase is this, knowing stuff isn't enough. Who knew? <laughs> I don't know, I just filled notebooks 
with Bible stuff, I'd be holy. No. If knowing facts about Jesus and giving mental assent to such facts were the essence of spiritual maturity, every kid in Bible club would grow up to be holy. MDiv students would be holier than illiterate grandmas who listened to stories about Jesus and prayed, and that's just not the way the world works. If information equals maturity, we live in an information society. We, Bethany, are one of the most educated communities in the city of Seattle. If information equals maturity, we should be the holiest people ever. But we're not. We, like the rest of our city, deal with anxiety and depression and fear and partisanship and greed and insecurity and wondering what tomorrow will bring. So Wilder, in his book, asks this question. If data about Jesus isn't the key to maturity, what is? And his stunning conclusion is this. Transformation doesn't come through mental ascent of information. It comes from what he calls attachment love. And this is rooted in scripture, I believe, but also rooted like psychologists are coming to understand that attachment love is this necessary love that we receive from someone that's transformative in our lives. You have attachment love with the person or people in your life who give you a sense of safety, unconditional love as seen as in their relentless commitment to you. When you have attachment love, then you're able to flourish. And I, this is what I want you to know this morning above everything else, Jesus' longing for you is this. I want you, says Jesus, to, to be so ravished by my love for you that you develop attachment love with me. Like Mary's did in Matthew 28. Jesus longed for attachment love. That's why in Matthew 23, 37, last week of his life, he stands at the gates of Jerusalem and he weeps. Why? He says, oh, Jerusalem, I long to gather you under my wings the way a mother hen gathers her chicks. I wanted to hug you. I wanted to ravish you. I wanted to love you. I wanted to serve you. I wanted to heal you. I wanted to free you. You would not. You'd argue. You'd fight to, to get free from Rome. You'd ask for bread but you wouldn't just receive profound love. And if I don't receive it, I'm not transformed. No matter how loud I sing. We love because he first loved us. That's what 1 John says. And so if I can't receive the love, I can't give the love. Come to me, all you who are laboring and, and, and weighed down. I'll give you rest. I, look, I want to be in relationship with you. I have loved you with an everlasting love, says Jesus. Abide in me, very erotic language, John 15, you'll bear fruit. <laughs> so my question to you this morning isn't, do you believe in the resurrection? Odds are you do. If you don't, there's plenty of evidence. Go look. But it's not the point this morning. The point is this. If you believe, what are you doing with it? Because there's two ways to go. Yeah, I believe, but I like it here. I like my job. I like my savings. I like my politics. I like my income. I like my life. Don't make me move. Th those are the guards. <laughs> those are the Sanhedrin, like the MDiv students. They've got it. Institutional religion, giving them a reputation, an influence, but it's not rooted in love. Or the women. Rooted in love, they become the first preachers heralding the resurrection. So we can believe, but when the day is done, the most important, the most significant question is this, what am I gonna do with what God has revealed to me? And I think the answer is until I'm ravished by this love, I won't follow, I'll cling. Some of us, thanks be to God, are so broken that we're ready to be ravished. Megan preached on that powerfully a couple of weeks ago. That was my story. Adopted, abandonment issues, and then my dad, who I love so deeply, died. <laughs> Lonely, anxious, depressed, making great grades in architecture school. 
and someone invited me to just sit and let the creator of the universe hug me and love me. And that attachment love changed everything for me. New major, new school, new state. I'm here today because of attachment love. For others, there's no you know, evidence, sense of brokenness. Rather, there's a sense of protection. I like it here. I like my life. I like my job. I like my savings. I like my influence. I like my house. I like Seattle. I like the markets. I like it. My word to you is don't cling. Why? Well, Ecclesiastes, in a nutshell, here's the summary. It's not going to last anyway. The one thing you have, bomb proof, is the love of Christ. And so, uh, as we close this morning, I'm going to invite you to do this with me. Would you just close your eyes? Just close your eyes. And would you, would you also close your fists for a minute here? Would you just do that? And would you pray with me? Father, here we are this morning. For many of us, with a life that we love, we love where we live, we love our health, we love our family. Others, not so much, but for the, for, I'm speaking to those whose fists are clinging to all that you've given us, and we, we don't want to face the implications of following you fully because we're afraid of what you'll take from us. Father, would you, by your grace, would you give us in a moment here to, the grace to name what we're, what we're afraid of losing? Is it health? Is it money? Is it job? And, now, Jesus, we just want to open our hands. Would you just open your hands with me now? We just want to open our hands. And we want to say, God, here, everything I've been clinging to, I'm, t- I'm so tired. <laughs> so tired of trying to protect it all. And here's the risen Jesus saying, it was never your job to protect it. I'll take care of you. All I want you to do is love me and follow me. And so with these empty hands, would you just lift them to the sky with me right now? Jesus, (laughs) thank you that you're alive and that you invite us out of love to follow you. Ravish us, fill us, guide us, protect us, provide for us, heal us as we live in your love, the risen Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.